Hi everyone and welcome to OGL Dev. My name is Itai Meiri. In this series of tutorials, we will explore OpenGL, which is the de facto standard graphics API on all non-Windows platforms such as uh, Linux, Android, Mac, and some of the game consoles as well. It is also available on Windows, but obviously DirectX is much more common on Windows. You can find my tutorial series in the form of web pages at ogldev.org. In this video, we will do the first step of opening a window, which is where all the action takes place. This is actually not part of the core OpenGL. The OpenGL designers have decided to separate the windowing stuff from the graphics, and they created a standard for each category of windowing slash operating system. So we have GLX on X window based systems such as Linux, CGL on the Mac, EGL on Android, and finally, WGL, more commonly called Wiggle, on Windows. So while the core OpenGL handles all the rendering, rasterization, texture mapping, whatever, you still need to use one of the windowing APIs in order to create a window. Now using these APIs can be a bit tedious. Luckily for us, we generally don't need to use any of this low-level stuff. Instead, we can use a high-level library that wraps all this in easy-to-use functions. These high-level libraries are often portable, so we can use the same windowing code across multiple operating systems. There are several options for this high-level library, such as FreeGLAT and GLFW. We're going to use FreeGLAT, and in the future I will show you how to use GLFW as well. Now, this entire series is written in C++, but the 3D techniques that we will study in the future are applicable to other languages, so you may want to stick around anyway. Last note, I'm using Emacs, but you can use any editor or ID that you're used to. At the end of the video, I will show you how to build the code and you can take the principles and apply them anywhere. So now let's go. Most libraries must be initialized before they can be used, and GLUT is no different. We do this by calling GLUT init. Notice that all API calls to this library are prefixed by GLUT, so that's easy to remember. We can pass in several runtime parameters to this function, which will modify the behavior of GLAT during that execution. For example, the display flag tells GLAT to cast its output on a remote system. Geometry controls the size and position of the window, and GLDebug tells GLAT to report on any failing OpenGL calls. I us usually don't use these, but it's good to know that they are there. The common practice is to call GLAT with argc and argv. This allows you to mix GLAT parameters with your application parameters on the command line. You may be wondering why we are passing in the address of argc rather than the value itself. The reason is that GLAT is supposed to extract its values from the command line arguments and update argc and argv accordingly. I actually tried that and it didn't work for me, so let me know if your experience is any different. Perhaps I did something wrong. Next up, we have GLAT init display mode, which does exactly what it says. The display mode is simply a combination of very high level attributes of the window. For example, you can set the color mode to be RGBA or indexed. With RGBA, you simply set the colors by providing a value for the red, green, blue, and alpha channels separately. In indexed mode, the colors are set in a palette, and you use an index to point to it. I believe indexed mode is a bit arcane, and we will be using RGBA. You can also choose to use a depth or stencil buffers, which will be important for us in the future. For now, we will be using a combination of RGBA and GLAT double in order to enable double buffering. This means that we will render into a back buffer while displaying the front buffer. When we finish, we switch their roles. The back buffer becomes the front buffer, so we can see what we have just rendered, and the front buffer becomes the back buffer, and we override it with the contents of the next frame. This helps us avoid problems of tiering that can occur when we display a frame as it is being rendered into. Glad need the display mode takes a bit mask, and we just need to combine the bits that we are interested in. Next, we configure the window size and initial position in pixels using GLAT init window size and GLAT init windows position, respectively. You can see that we are going to create 
an HD-like window at position 200 on the x-axis and 100 on the y-axis. Finally, we create the window by calling glut create window. This function takes in a string which will be used as the window title. This function returns an integer handle which starts at 1. I'm printing it here and you can see that we are indeed getting a value of 1. Right there. Now that we have our window, we meet our first OpenGL API. Remember that all OpenGL functions are prefixed by GL. GL clear color sets the, the color that will be used when we clear the window, but it doesn't perform the actual clearing. This will happen in the render function, which we'll shortly review. The way that OpenGL works in general is that there is a big state object behind the scenes that you can configure with tons of attributes such as buffers, textures, render states, etc. You do this using various set state kind of functions and you use action oriented functions such as draw and clear to actually perform the, the required operation. This allows us in this case to set the clear color for our frame and then just call clear all over and over again without specifying the color. GL clear color takes in four parameters for the four channel types in RGBA. The type of these values is GL clamp F, which means a floating point, which will be clamped by the system to the range 0 to 1. There are various format types, but usually you should get a 24-bit color window which means that we have 256 different values per channel. Therefore, you need to go from 0 to 1 in steps of 1 divided by 256 each in order to cover all the possible values. Next, we need to register a render callback function. The way that GLAT works is by hooking into the event queue of the windowing system and listening to window and other system events. It will deliver them to your application using a callback functions that you must register. There are several callback function types for the different events, but the minimum is to have a function to handle the rendering. This usually becomes the main entry point into the application and the root of all the 3D heavy lifting. Finally, we call GLAT main loop. This transfers the control over to GLAT and indeed this function never returns. The return zero at the end is just to keep the compiler happy. GLAT main loop starts listening to the window system events and it will call our render callback function. Let's review it now. So our render callback is a very simple function that takes no parameters and returns nothing. We do two things here. First, we clear the window. Theoretically, if you don't do that, you may get junk in the frame. It all depends on the behavior of the graphics driver because some of them may create a window buffer which is already cleared. Next, we call glad swap buffers, which will swap the roles of the front and back buffers as, as we discussed earlier. Let's try clearing the window to all red by setting the red channel to 1. Okay, this works fine. Now let's try changing the color on every frame. We can easily do that using a static variable for the channel color, which we will increment by 1 divided by 256 on every pass through the render callback. When we hit 1, we reset back to 0. It's better to check for greater than because of possible floating point numerical issues. Let's try to run this. Hmm, that doesn't work. Let's print the value of our, our color variable.
As you can see, it is printed only twice, which means that our render callback was executed only twice. So GLAD doesn't think it needs to automatically call our render function over and over again unless there is some event in the system that requires it. In order to force it to do that, we need to call GLAD post redisplay, which will set some internal GLAD flag that will make it call the render function again. So let's do that. Now we can see that we are indeed getting a spectrum of colors. So we have the entire source code for the tutorial and now we need to build it. I actually hate build systems, so in small project I simply use a build script to take care of the build without any complex dependency checks and other fancy stuff. Even when there are multiple source files involved, everything is built from scratch every time. In each tutorial directory, there is a build sh script that must be executed from within that directory in order to work properly. Let's look at it now. If you're using an IDE such as CLine, Eclipse, or NetBeans, or your own makefile, you can simply take this recipe and apply it there. You can see that we are using G++. This is the default compiler for the entire tutorial series. First, we initialize the LD flags, flags variable with the result of calling package config minus minus libs on glue. I'm not going to talk about glue right now. I'll just say that in a nutshell, glue provides the declarations of all the OpenGL functions supported by the current system and enables us to link with the OpenGL libraries. If you're not familiar with, open, with package config, it is a handy utility that returns compile and leak flags for many libraries. It uses some, some installation database, database for the current system, so on each Linux distribution, it may return a different value, which is correct locally. This provides flexibility and increasing, increases the chances that build command will work on different systems. Let's see what happens when, you, when we run this command in the terminal. As you can see, we get three link flags for glue itself, as well as GLU, the OpenGL utility library, as well as the OpenGL library itself, which represents the driver. Next, we concatenate minus L GLAT to LD flags in order to link with GLAT. Unfortunately, GLAT doesn't support package config, so I simply added it manually in this way. If you get an error that the library cannot be found, you will need to add a minus capital L flag to point to its location. By the way, all these libraries should have been installed by the install requirements script I mentioned in the getting up and running with OGL dev video. Make sure to watch that if you have more questions. So now we have a window opened and we are ready to begin. I hope you found this video useful. Let me know in the comments what you think. In the next video, we will put our first dot on the screen. Thanks for watching and I hope to see you soon.